Hello everyone, my name is Taras Minkowski and today I'm here to talk to you about uh, the architecture of Heroku-like developer experience. In this presentation we're going to talk about what was it about Heroku that made Heroku so popular and if it was so popular why didn't why are we talking about creating a Heroku-like experience and not using Heroku itself? We're going to talk about the architecture of um, the of of a Heroku-like experience um, and look at the the elements that make up that architecture and talk about five use cases um, that made Heroku popular that you can replicate on your platform using the architecture. So let's start off by talking about you know why, why Heroku, uh, because it was launched 16 years ago. What was it that made Heroku so popular? I think first and foremost, it, um, it was one of the first um, Platform, platform as a service that offered a really new experience. Um, and this experience was really geared towards self-service to allow developers to do um, to be able to do what they needed to do and get get their work done quickly with as little friction as possible. It really was um, a, an excellent developer experience. And there were certain uh, certain certain workflows that Heroku really pioneered and really got right. And um, uh, these workflows are first and foremost kind of built on top of this idea that you can push a commit into a repository, which is going to trigger deployment. And um, a developer was able to create um, a database themselves uh, and uh, provision that database uh, and run it in the database in production with very little time and very little setup. Um, a developer could have in 30 seconds a database that would typically take a month to two months to set up uh, for uh, on any uh, platform uh, managed by an IT department. And uh, developers were able to manage the secrets uh, for their services without having to jump through any hoops um, and the process was predictable and reliable. And developers could easily see logs for their services um, and they were available to them at their fingertips uh, in the browser and the CLI. Um, and when the developers were ready to promote the service to production, they could do that without having to get on a call with 20 people who were sitting there watching them uh, type commands in the, in, into the keyboard just in case something goes wrong. And um, so developers really love this pro these um, self-serve workflows. It, it really made developers very productive. And so why, why is it that um, a platform that was so loved by developers ultimately wasn't the one that we are all using today? Uh, and why are we talking about replacing, you know, building this experience on, on our platforms? And I think it fundamentally comes down to the fact that um, large companies uh, do not trust running their services on um, on platforms that they don't control. And so um, most companies today want to be able to run their services within their network and um, ultimately make sure that the, the network, uh, make sure that the platform matches their needs and scale, scales to their needs. Um, and that is something that Heroku couldn't really do at the scale that, that the companies want to be able to do today. Um, but this friction between the, the needs of developers and the needs of the, um, of the uh, organization created a situation where developers were using Heroku even though their organization didn't allow it and uh, it created this uh, shadow IT situation where d developers were essentially doing something um, and hiding it from their IT department. Um, and th this is what, um, this is why Heroku ultimately, you know, isn't the platform that we're using today, but we can take the ideas that, that make Heroku so popular and introduce those ideas into a platform to make sure that our developers love our platforms as much as they, uh, as developers love Heroku then. So let's look at the, uh, how our, uh, the architecture to and, and make sure that we are understand how the different pieces kind of fit together. So um, we'll start off first uh, by 
start off with developers. So developer touches two things. They talk, touch their backstage portal, developer portal, where they can see services and uh, they can see information about services, or they can uh, they interact with the terminal where they can use a, a CLI tool to interact with the services, uh, to get information about the services. But ultimately what they can do in, a C- in the browser, they can also do in their CLI. The both backstage and the CLI talk to a platform API, which is response, which is a gateway into the platform. It has access to everything that runs within the platform, and it provides a normalized interface to both the backstage and the CLI. And one of the added benefits to this is that if you need to change something behind the scenes, you can change those those um, uh, change the backends without having to impact developers. So if you, for whatever reason, decide to switch vaults, you know, if you go from uh, Microsoft from Azure Vault to uh, HashiCorp Vault, you can make that change on the hood without impacting developers because they're interacting with the CLI and, and backstage. The platform orchestrator is responsible for for um, storing the, the the known configuration of uh, of services and making sure that that configuration matches the provisioned resources. Um, and then, knowing what the provisioned resources are, it it ensures that the uh, manifests that are used to up, uh, to deploy to Kubernetes um, are mapped correctly to the services that are ne- to the resources that are needed to run those workloads. Um, if your platform uses Terraform, then your orchestrator will be responsible for applying uh, uh, applying uh, configuration to uh, to Terraform, which in turn will do provisioning um, and um, uh, of services for you. The um, CI is, is responsible for building container images and pushing those container images into the registry, uh, container registry. Of course, there's a lot more to the CI. The CI does a lot more, but for the for the sake of our conversation, we're going to focus on the on C, on CI as it pertains to. Um, Right into the container registry and uh, interacting with it with the um, orchestrator. So that's kind of a, a you know a quick overview. Now let's let's get into the actual use cases and kind of talk through it. So first and foremost, the developer needs to be able to uh, push a commit and deploy it to development environment. So the way that we go about doing that, they would they would make changes in the editor. Uh, they would save those changes uh, and commit commit those changes and push them into the version control system. Now, from there, your version control system is hooked up to CI, which um, will run a CI workflow that will build a container image and build, push the container image into the container registry. And it will also uh, take a score.yaml file, which is a score.yaml file is used for declaring what resources a workload needs. It will take the score.yaml file and it will push the score.yaml file into the orchestrator. Now, your orchestrator is monitoring your um, contain, uh, container registry, and when the um, when a new container image becomes available, it uses the configuration that it knows and the score that YAML information to generate the um, generate a Kubernetes manifest. So in this case, uh, since we haven't made any changes to score that YAML file, we're just deploying uh, we're, we're just deploying uh, code changes. Uh, so what we'll do is it, what it will do is it will uh, just generate generate a, a Kubernetes manifest and um, apply the manifest to Kubernetes, um, and the deployment is now complete. So once the deployment in Kubernetes finishes, it will the workload uh, will be writing the new code using the container image that was built in CI. Now, uh, now now that the the the, uh, the, serv- the the first version of service is running. Um, let's say a developer wants to be able to add a database. And so the way they would go to do, about doing this on the internal develop platform is to, um, they would start by uh, making a change to score that YAML file to say that uh, they would like to um, make a database available to their uh, to their workload. So what do, they would do that by um, adding a, a resource to the score that YAML file of a certain database type. So let's say they want to add a, Postgres, they would say type Postgres, and um, what options are available are controlled by your platform. But uh, you know, for the com- you know, common features uh, are often Postgres, MySQL, 
uh, maybe Redis. Uh, you know, it's the, these are the kind of things that developers would want to be able to use, um, and they would control those things within within the Square YAML file. So they they add that resource, but uh, adding the resource is not enough because they also need to say how the how the the workload needs to know how to connect to that resource once it's provisioned. And so what we need is we need to specify how the secrets or the credentials of connecting to that resource are going to be mapped on into the workload. So that's going to be through through the uh, mapping of the environment variables, and that information is stored um, in your score that YAML file. So. Uh, they make changes to score that YAML file to push into into the version control system. Now, from there, we build a container image and push into container registry, and we upload the score that YAML file to the to the orchestrator. Now, the orchestrator um, knows that the previous version. So, the orchestrator is monitoring the the container image uh, container registry, and uh, it, it is now kind of kicked off. So now it needs to do the work of deploying the service. Now. It knows that the current version that's running in, in Kubernetes um, is not, it doesn't have, it, it didn't have anything provisioned. So what it needs to do, it, it, it needs to provision a, a new uh, database based on the declaration of the score.yaml file. So it creates a plan based on on, on, the, on diffing the score.yaml that was used previously and the score.yaml uh, that, that, is a, that is part of this current commit. Based on that, it figures out that it needs to create a database. Um, it provisions a database, but now it has secrets that need to be uh, stored in the uh, in the vault because those secrets are necessary to be used uh, the, to 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 connect the workload to the database. So it pushes those secrets into the into the vault, uh, but we need to get those secrets into the um, into the um, somehow into the um, into Kubernetes, so uh, we have a secret operator that reads the vault um, and synchronizes the vault with Kubernetes. And, and then uh, once that uh, those secrets are synchronized, uh, then it's able to generate the uh, manifest and apply those to Kubernetes. And so now it's going to have the environment variables. The environment variables are going to provide the credentials, and the workload is going to start use those environment variables to connect to the database. Now. Um, if it's, so now that they have the database set up, but now let's say they want to they want to integrate their service with a um, with third party some third party API that has an API token. So we need to get this API token into the into the configuration. So they would go the way they'll go about that. They would go into the backstage and, or the CLI, and they would edit the um, uh, they would specify the the secret. That secret would be relayed to the orchestrator, and the orchestrator would write that secret into 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 the vault. The vault would synchronize uh, using the secrets operator with Kubernetes, but now we have those in Kubernetes, but we still need to get um, the mapping specified. So the developer would push a score.yaml file uh, with the environment variable mapping into the um, into the repository. That would the CI would be triggered and it would send the score.yaml file into the orchestrator. The orchestrator would um, see that it needs to make a new deployment, um, and it would generate the new manifests um, using the configuration that it, it saw in the score YAML file, and it would apply that the configuration to Kubernetes. Now, um, so now they have the the, the their database uh, hooked up, and they have their their uh, environment variables configured for the. Uh, with with the token to the external service, now they would like to see the logs of, of the running service. So what they would do here is they would uh, go into Backstage or they're going to the CLI, um, which would query the the platform API. The platform API, because it has access to all the uh, platform uh, services, it would connect to the log, logging backend. But for the logging backend to have the information uh, about the logs, it needs to uh, somehow receive those logs. So those logs would be sent to it from a um, from a, a logging operator or some kind of an agent that would monitor the the workload, so it would run inside of Kubernetes, monitor the nodes in the workload, and then relay that that um, information into the logging backend. Which would uh, and then once it's, the information is in logging backend, it's able to the, the API can query it and make that available to Backstage. Um, so all of that happens kind of at the the relaying of the logs happens continuously, but the API um, fetches the logs from the logging backend when the user needs to view them. Now, um, once the user um, 
is you know satisfied with their service now they want to promote it, promote that service to production so they would go to do, to do that they would go into backstage they would see a list of the uh, previously built uh, container images um, and they would pick one they would hit promote which would send a uh, API request to the platform API which would relay it to the platform orchestrator the platform orchestrator uh, would then determine uh, it would compare what's running in production to what is um, to, to the uh, score that YAML file that's associated with, to the commit to the container image that we're trying to deploy. It would create a plan and provision the necessary resources. Those resources would would uh, get credentials that are stored in a vault. The credentials get synchronized with the um, using the secrets operator, um, and um, then the orchestrator would generate the manifest and apply those to Kubernetes. And that would complete the, the the last use case. And now you have we have covered five use cases of a Heroku-like developer experience, uh, which includes push to deploy, um, database provisioning, uh, secret management, logging, and promotion to, to production. I hope that this um, helped you helps you understand um, the architecture of these use cases. And um, um, I wish you the best. Um, and again, my name is Taras Minkowski, and you can find me on Twitter or on GitHub. Thank you very much, and have a great day.